Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Vicki Palmer, AURP CEO, and delighted to see you all today on today's webinar. Today we'll be discussing our AURP communities of practice in our tech-based economic development sector. So today's webinar is on the space and aerospace technologies uh, are, that are building communities of innovation on the ground. And today's topic is especially pertinent with our all space uh, civilian spacewalk um, with SpaceX, really exciting times. So our communities of practice is an online discussion that offers support to our a in, in our AORP relationship with SSTI to increase capacity among EDA grantees to achieve greater impacts within their regional innovation economies. So for those of you that are new to our AORP network, since 1986, AORP continues as the original community of innovation. We're a convening organization for place-based and people-centric uh, research communities and their leadership. So we unite academia, research, and economic development executives um, and offer a unique forum for the exchange of knowledge in all matters of public-private partnerships, advancing innovation and global prosperity. AORP's reach today has really expanded beyond our university-centric um, sector, and we've grown to include innovation districts, incubators, medical research centers, federal labs, community, co community colleges, and so many more. So AER's pur purpose is really to provide the programming the resources and the opportunities to share best practices and experiences to build up peers and their like-minded communities. Our upcoming um, AERP programming, our next webinar on October 29th, we'll talk about funding resources, especially in those building our clean tech ecosystems. And then we have an annual conference coming up in Arkansas where all trails will lead to innovation. Um, November 11th through the 14th, and that's hosted by the University of Arkansas, and we'll be in Fayetteville and Bentonville, so really um, interesting information to be shared there to, um, today, too. So focusing on today's webinar, we have three um, AORP members joining us, and they'll share their varied strategies to attract and retain um, talent, and also the public-private partnerships that have grown and sustained their aerospace and defense communities. So I have a, uh, Aaron Koshut, who's current AURP president, and she's with Cumming Research Park. We have Matt Sassero, who's with Matrix Labs at the University of Maryland in their A. James Clark School of Engineering. And in a little bit, we'll have Tim Sweeney. He's with Jobs Ohio in their advanced manufacturing, aerospace, and aviation sector. So I really appreciate you all being on board today um, to discuss your own unique communities in innovation. And to everybody that is on this call today, um, just as a quick reminder, please put your questions in the queue and some of those will be answered online during discussions as well as we'll be having a Q&A sector at the end of this call. So thank you so much for being on today and Erin, take it away. Great. Thank you, Vicki. And hello everyone. Uh, delighted to be here with you today. Um, briefly before we begin, one of the areas uh, that I wanted to highlight uh, that AURP is involved in that is particularly uh, relatable to today's um, webinar is the AURP Air and Space Caucus. And I am co-chair of that uh, caucus um, with my friend Matt, who's one of our other panelists today. Um, and the Air and Space Caucus that AURP has put together works with state aviation and space business councils and associations, research universities, and national groups like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Space Foundation to advance national and regional networks and public policies that support communities of air and space innovation. In fact, AURP's award-winning model, RAIN, which stands for Rural Autonomous Innovation Network, recently was a stage one winner in the SBA's 2024 Growth Accelerator Fund. And through RAIN, AURP will leverage our existing university members, those ecosystem partners, the RAIN makers, 
plus support firms in rural EPSCOR states and other rural areas across the country. RAIN will catalyze the development of startup autonomous air and ground vehicle firms from universities and partnering communities and endeavor to involve HBCUs and MSIs in rural areas for advancement of those industries, connecting them with autonomous industry catalysts, funders, regulatory support, and entrepreneurial training. So air and space is well a pretty big space, pun intended. Today, we have three distinctive case studies to showcase how different communities and stakeholders have approached leveraging their assets to catalyze development and growth in air and space on the ground. So without further ado, we'll dive in and um, I'll begin by highlighting and sharing about Cummings Research Park and particularly for us, it is about, uh, as Vicki mentioned, those P3, those public-private partnerships um, that really were behind and are behind a lot of our our growth and opportunities. And so uh, Cummings Research Park has been around since 1962. And so we say we've been propelling science since then. Uh, really is aligned with our past, our present, and our future. Next slide, please. But first and foremost, CRP is a community of innovation. And so AURP really categorizes it in this way. Um, and, and, and really, you can see the ties to the university piece are um, really a part of every community of innovation. And um, when I look at, you know, these areas, these strengths that are pulled out from, you know, the public assets and the amenities and the business life cycle and so on and so forth, it really is aligned with talent and that, that key workforce that everyone across the country is um, working on strategies and initiatives to retain and recruit. Um, it's about uh, that next generation of uh, our companies, our startup ecosystems um, that are so much aligned with either the research or the university, or in our case in CRP, it's also the corporate innovation centers that come from those larger corporates um, that support and, and or locate at a university um, that we have in our park. And so um, that's really, you know, some of those emphasis that that life cycle, if you will, that's on the right hand side does align and showcase all of the different elements that make up a community of innovation. Next slide. So CRP uh, did a 2016, did a comprehensive master plan. And part of that uh, master plan is an assessment of our strengths um, and really in capabilities and in assets. And it did look across workforce development as a key uh, capability driver uh, in our community. We're located in Huntsville, Alabama, AKA the Rocket City. And uh, so we have both that history and that, that, um, that current um, and future looking um, technology base in air and space. And for us in Huntsville, air and space um, is, is also crosses the defense world. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit. And so when I look at these innovation growth opportunities that came out of the capabilities and assets assessment that we did, for us, air and space touches every single one of these growth opportunities that are on this slide, even yes, in biotech, uh, through some of the work at Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology and some of their space ag tech work uh, that is happening there. Next slide. So this is a little bit about CRP. Um, and uh, we are the second largest in the US with 3,843 acres. We have 300 companies. 50% of those are Huntsville-based companies, and those companies employ more than 20,000 employees. Inside CRP, we do have a tier one research university in the University of Alabama in Huntsville, but we also have the state's largest community college and two high schools, including a statewide residential magnet high school focused on cyber technology and engineering, which of course is aligned with those air and space assets. And our companies uh, currently generate 800 plus patents across the research park. Next slide. Diving in a little bit more into you know, some of the more relevant aspects um, we've got 15 million square feet um, on the ground here, and our occupancy park-wide is around 82%. But interestingly enough, 85% of our companies are in that aerospace and defense. Now, um, that really is uh, driven by um, both how we were founded 
with a uh, connection to Dr. Werner von Braun and the Apollo program and the rocket scientist team that came here through Operation Paperclip and continues today through the growth of the Redstone Arsenal, which is not an FOB, a forward operating base. Redstone Arsenal is a federal R&D center of excellence with 72 different federal agencies that are just a mile outside of CRP. And so that um, really positions us to be the most defense oriented research park in the country. The remaining industries that you find in CRP are biotech through that Hudson Alpha Institute, as well as commercial and IT. Interestingly enough, 90% of the companies are small business. So while we do have the large businesses and through those federal government contractors, but we also have a very significant focus on small business. And I think that um, ties a lot to both the kind of work that does on Redstone Arsenal, but also what you see coming out of that, that startup ecosystem and the scaling of those companies. More than 90% of the employees in the park have four-year degrees and the second highest economic impact behind Redstone Arsenal. I, I had mentioned that. Um, and that really is a driver with more than $50 billion of budgets managed here. So CRP sits inside Huntsville, as I mentioned. And so I'm going to take a bit of a step back just to show um, really some of uh, about the aerospace and defense industry that we have here. And then the linkages that that happens in CRP and some examples of how we have seen those different partnerships happen. So next slide, please. We have 400 different companies and organizations representing 80,000 employees in the aerospace and defense industry in Huntsville. This is a snapshot of those that uh, would be more of those household names um, across the country that are supporting uh, the warfighter. And of the 50 companies that are represented on that slide, 36 are located inside the park. Um, so you, you know, find about 75% of that aerospace and defense industry in our community is located in the research park, which creates a robust ecosystem that where these companies both um, compete against each other and they also collaborate with one another. And everyone wants to see everyone succeed, even if that means that perhaps some companies lose on different contracts. And, but really these, even the larger companies across this space support the small businesses. They work with the university and the community college and even at the high school level to create internship opportunities, to create growth and ideas um, that you know push these technologies forward that support the warfighter, support these global missions um, even in commercial space as it may be as well. Next slide, please. I wanted to drill into three examples uh, today, um, you know, pretty quickly. Um, Lockheed Martin, a very household name, as everyone knows, they have um, uh, just over 1,600 employees here. Their main site is in the research park, um, and that is where they're doing engineering and manufacturing for the Army's long-range hypersonics weapon, Black Hawk helicopter, future vertical lift programs, and the Missile Defense Agency's Next Generation Interceptor. They've recently expanded to include an engineering facility just outside the park, as well as a missile defense integration lab in CRP. Um, and recently, within the last couple of years, they acquired both Sikorsky and I-3's hypersonics division, both which had separate locations in the park. So that was uh, uh, both an opportunity, as they say, um, as we worked with them on from that facility standpoint uh, through the acquisition. Blue Origin um, is one of our more recent um, examples of the aerospace industry in Research Park with more than 1,200 employees. They initially started out with, we're going to produce the BE3U and BE4 engines in the park. Um, and then they um, committed again to the Huntsville market and they refurbished and they operate NASA's test stand 4670. The, for those of you that may not know, that's the test stand that is historic. It was the one where um, the Saturn V was tested um, at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. So they refurbished that. That's where they're testing their engines. The um, you can hear the roar of the engine testing all over Huntsville um, almost on a weekly basis right now. And then they've uh, established a new location to manufacture Blue Ring, which is a multi-mission, multi-orbit space platform. They approach their manufacturing in a very different way in that they align and engineering teams with that manufacturing uh, process with each engine, with each element, so that if there are problems, they can immediately go and 
um, tackle those, solve those, and keep the the uh, piece moving forward. So it's a very engineering intensive approach in their manufacturing. And then the last is Aerojet Rocketdyne, which is now an L3 Harris company. They have 780 employees here. They, um, as Aerojet Rocketdyne, relocated their defense headquarters to CRP from California. And then as we're seeing a trend here, they located their first manufacturing facility in North Huntsville, just about a 10 minute drive from the park, their rocket shop where they're doing propulsion and energetic systems for aerospace and defense. And then they've got a new location at the Jetplex, which is the airport, again, about a 10 minute drive from the research park where they're doing production and assembly of inert solid rocket motor components, such as cases and nozzles. So having that engineering focused defense, the headquarters and office environment in the park uh, that's doing the R&D work that before it goes to prototype and before it goes to full manufacturing scale production uh, is what we're seeing as a trend with companies um, as they do that. As we looked across our aerospace and defense industry here in Huntsville and um, really as a targeted industry for us, given that heritage, one of the things we also took a look at the same time was our entrepreneurial ecosystem. And when we do that, we're looking at not only our existing companies, we're looking at the university, existing entrepreneurial service providers, we've just really kind of took a full scale look at this. And we said, while we had had historical growth in startups in defense and aerospace through entities like Teledyne Brown Engineering, uh, Sanmina SCI, Dynetics, and so many others, we really have seen entrepreneurial growths here um, as a, in areas that are commercial based um, and commercial tech or you know consumer based technology, and that we really needed to create an opportunity to generate that um, legacy industry here um, through startups. And um, so next slide, we uh, just gosh, maybe a month ago, announced a defense tech accelerator inside the park. Um, and uh, this accelerator um, utilizes Innovate Alabama, uh, a statewide innovation corporation that has a new program using tax liability credits. And we will be um, kicking off this program with the first cohort in November. Next slide. It's a 12 week accelerator program for early stage companies that have that commercial or current defense product. And they either want to grow it into commercial, they want to grow it from Air Force to Army or um, commercial into government uh, markets. And so each cycle will have five companies. This uh, is the companies will participate without paying a fee and we will not um, take equity in the companies. This is about generating their revenue. And we have a goal um, for these graduates to secure at least one prime contract, uh, a subcontract with, with a prime or an OEM or raise uh, in private capital. So we're really excited about what this could mean for generating the next um, the next Dynetics, the next Sanmina SCIs um, and partnering uh, with Innovate Alabama, partnering with a number of our financial institutions and women owned small businesses to make this accelerator happen for Huntsville using this innovative program that is um, allows us to fund this from the state. And then my final slide before we uh, kick it over to one of my panelists um, is really, you know, how did we identify this perspective and how did we leverage these resources and overcome challenges? And so I wanted to highlight a few things that I thought were takeaways for other communities is we really did build off our community strengths from Redstone Arsenal to the University of Alabama in Huntsville, that private sector growth, and we align those with our assets and research, always assessing, always looking for those opportunities for growth um, and aligning those with capabilities and our assets and building off those. Um, state support of technology and innovation that's aligned with our community growth from its earliest days through today, you know, that's had its ups and downs based on what our, our state um, government bodies look like and the opportunities and the constant need for messaging and awareness building um, as a community. Werner von Braun did that when he went to the legislature to ask for um, support for NASA's earliest days, as well as money to start up the Graduate Research Institute in Huntsville, which is how UAH began. And we see that today through the work at Innovate Alabama. But it didn't happen overnight. 
we've been, you know, going from an agricultural based community to where we are today took 80 years, 60 plus in CRP. And um, so it's just been, you know, continuing to progress, continuing to move forward. Um, and my next two slides really align with it wasn't always good <laughs> um, or it wasn't always uh, two steps forward and another two steps forward without any steps back. Um, but I can say with two things is that stay aware and aligned with what happens at the state and the federal level and advocate advocate proactively what is most important and impactful to your community and to take advantage of all opportunities, both the good and the bad. So we've had programs that have shut down year over year where we had a lot of industry growth around those programs. You can talk about the Apollo program, you can talk about the shuttle program. And what I think what you know we have done is that when programs would shut down and when they would close or something would move, what are opportunities that can be created and driven before that happens? And again, leveraging back to those strengths and the capabilities and the assets. Um, but you have to be plugged in and aware, so the bullet above, um, in order to proactively do that so that your community can keep um, diversifying, can keep progressing, even with, you know, potentially these program shutdowns or movements or closing. So uh, my next slide is my final slide, which is just my contact information for you all afterwards um, to utilize. And then um, now we'll be moving on. And I think we've got Matt Scassero uh, next, if I remember correctly. Yes. And Matt um, is going to talk to us a little bit more um, about his his role and some of the things he's seen. And um, Matt was previously director of UMD's UAS test site, among his many roles. Um, and as I mentioned, he serves with me as co-chair of AURP's Air and Space Caucus. So Matt, take it away. Thanks, Aaron. And I always I love following you because uh, it's just the connections are all there. But I always have to have that five seconds of wow. But then I remember that she has that 80 years part in there. So you're going to see uh, the same kind of outcomes that we're looking for here is lessons for you to take away things to think about as you look at your own research parks, innovation districts, whatever. But we wanted to show different levels of maturity. And speaking as an aviator, talking about maturity, we're not even going to go there. But if you go to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to talk about our Aero Park Innovation District, which is in Southern Maryland. Uh, and I if you can't get an old movie reference into a presentation, you're just not doing it right. So Doctors and Aero Park, uh, it's research and how we're folding research into the creation of the Aero Park Innovation District. And that's the story I'm going to tell. But again, we're at a totally different maturity level than what Aaron and uh, the uh, Cummings Research Park and probably you hear from Tim with Jobs Ohio. Uh, we're in a very nascent stage, just getting off the got to go with just getting off the ground, taking flight. So uh, we're going to talk about that story and some of the lessons that we took away that we're still learning, still taking away. And several of my compatriots are here uh, watching the webinar today. My contact information is there. Aaron gave you a little bit of my background. I'm retired naval aviator. I've uh, been working at the university for over ten years now, doing a drone uh, test site, and now I'm in a brand new research facility. Uh, dedicated to autonomous technologies research. The interesting thing is I have zero training in economic development. I've never been a research park person, and yet I'm in the middle of this with my friends Chris and Coulter and other folks uh, that are dialed in with us here, uh, in the middle of this. And that's going to come through, I think, in the story as we go. So if you go to the next slide, we'll say out what the first challenge was for what eventually became the Aero Park. And it started with the, the benefit. Maryland is a tech-heavy economy. We have more federal labs. We have more federal funding than most states. We have so much emphasis on education and research and the number of R1 universities, both public and private. Just a lot of stuff going on. But Southern Maryland is a little different flavor than the rest of the state, especially than Central and uh, North Central Maryland. It's very heavily dependent on the DOD dollar, primarily from Naval Aviation with Naval Air Systems Command, Naval Air Station Patuxent River, Pax River for short. About 85% of our economy is directly or indirectly dependent on that DOD dollar. And the effects of timeline changes, uh, continuing resolutions, government shutdowns, sequestration is immediately felt within weeks, months of sequestration decisions. We had hotels and restaurants shuttering. 
So it really brought it clearly through to us that we need to be looking at diversifying our economy. And what else can we do? Not to lose, not to disrespect the DOD dollar, but to build on it. And where do we go with that in our partnerships? How do we increase that opportunity for everyone? Because we have a high ALICE rate here in the county. Again, we're a rural, remote county in the state of Maryland. So we have some communities that are underexposed, underrepresented in these industries. So we really wanted to think consciously about that, not just diversifying the economic dollar, but diversifying the community opportunity as well. And a lot of what we were looking at was uh, drones, uh, the technologies, the research going into drones and autonomous technology. So it, we focused on the technologies, but it's about the people, but it's actually the technologies too. So it's everything. So next slide, please. When we looked at the state, when we thought about who are our partnerships, who do we need to be working with? When we looked at the two primary tech corridors that were in the state were biotechnology and cybersecurity, and they've been here for decades. Cybersecurity center around Fort Meade, biotechnology really Baltimore out to uh, NIH and the uh, other health uh, administrations and organizations out there. And we looked at who makes up those corridors and how do they create their identities, and it's those partners. And in red, small red uh, terminology around the slide here, we saw that the university system of Maryland was a very critical partner in all of the regions and specifically in those corridors. So when we looked at what we're doing with autonomy, not just air, but ground, surface, subsurface, even space, we looked at all the work going on and we found there's a tremendous amount, including the university system of Maryland, the University of Maryland, and our own small campus down here, the Regional Education Center, University System of Maryland at Southern Maryland, USMSM. And there's no better acronym, trust me. Uh, so we looked at that. We said, we need to create this autonomy quarter. Next slide, please. And when we looked at that, we want to see who are our big players. On the federal labs, as I mentioned earlier, with the number of federal labs and the identities of those federal, federal labs, the criticality of those labs in that national mission, but also in their state employment and their state impact. And then the education institutions that are here, again, a lot of R1s, private and public. And you can see all the names there. University of Maryland, my employer for the Clark School of Engineering, is the flagship university. And I like to say when we talk to uh, partners and new customers, you can't name any field of research that I probably can't find somebody in the University of Maryland that does that. That's the extent, both the width and the depth of research that we represent. But all of our partners, Johns Hopkins, Howard University, just across the border over in D.C., and then again, all those federal apps. And then all the way down to the south there with NOC AD, Naval Air Warfare Center, Aircraft Division at Naval Air Station Patuxent River, that's the southern anchor. And that's where we started to look at this creation of this air park. But this is just the government and academia. Next slide. We also wanted to think about the industry folks. And again, lo and behold, we have a tremendous amount, especially for a fairly small geographic size state, we have a tremendous number of industries working in autonomous technologies across all the domains. In Southern Maryland, we tend to focus on aviation, air, aerospace, but the rest of the state, there is maritime, there is ground, robotics research, uh, NSWC, Indian Head, all the folks that focus on the groundwork, steer, uh, working on the actual AI, the brains of driverless cars and things. So we have that industry piece. All we had to do, all we had to do was bring it together, focus it. Next slide, please. So what we did, uh, again, looking at all the areas that we need to be thinking about and working in, we also had a lot of multi-domain research collaborations. We we're focusing on Southern Maryland, that aviation, but we have these multi-domain relationships that you can see listed here. Again, mostly federal labs, but not just DOD. We have NASA in there as well, both Goddard and WAPS. In fact, they just stood up their own new alliance based on uh, the defense alliances in the state here. But we also have the Chesapeake Bay Lab and the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Studies here in Solomons, but with 12 other, other locations around the watershed, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And then you have, again, the research universities and, again, industry with IRAD and sponsored research. The research component of all this, in Southern Maryland, we don't have a lot of capacity for manufacturing, but we have tremendous capacity in research, prototyping, and development. So with all those things that we're thinking about, next slide, we were really focusing on what do we need to be doing? What do we need to be pulling together? How do we make this something real? So one of the things we looked at in this process about six, seven years ago was there, going to be, there was going to be a new building built on the campus here at USMSM, and it was going to be a classroom expansion, about 37,000 square feet. And our state partners, including Coulter Menke, who's here with us from the Department of Commerce, they all teamed up with us, a small group of us said, 
what if? And we said, let's not just make it classroom. Let's make it research. Let's look at entrepreneur support. Let's look at community building. Let's talk about being a hub of a research park. And we built the SMART building, Southern Maryland Autonomous Research and Technology Building, which is incorporated in with the University of Maryland Matrix Lab, Maryland Autonomous Technology Research, Innovation, and Exploration. And it has all the characterizations you see on the left there. It's a place that people can come for education and research, attract that talent, but take advantage of those partnerships with the Navy, with the university, with industry, with all those folks we talked about in the Autonomy Corridor. Take advantage of that co-location of our UAS test site, which is now the UAS Research and Operations Center, the UROC. But that bottom bullet there was big focus for us. Again, Southern Round, remote, on a peninsula. We don't want to recreate the wheel if we don't have to. The state and the university have tremendous programs. Sammy Popot on the uh, webinar with us here has a rep of those many of those programs. MTech, MIPS, MII, uh, the DCI Corps. We wanted to bring those programs down to Southern Round virtually at first, but eventually with people, and it's already starting to happen. So with all that said, back around 2019, next slide, please. We thought, here is what we need to create, the Aeropark Innovation District, where ideas take flight. And my county colleagues here on the uh, webinar with us are the owners of this, the uh, real creators of this, working with branding companies and uh, uh, collaborators and advisors. This is what they pulled together. This is actually from our county economic development site, the master plan for the Air Park Innovation District. And you can see the partners that we've had, many of whom I've already mentioned, but it's all of those characteristics. Again, not just aviation, multi-domain, but it's building on that and then taking that to where it goes next. And that yellow circle in the middle is actually my building here at the USMSM campus. It really is the physical, but also the conceptual hub of what we got going on down here. So one of the first things we did, of course, upper right-hand corner was join AURP, and you'll see why here in just a second. So next slide. So for all of you, and the real purpose of this webinar was, so how did you do it? So I wanted to kind of pull out several items that were things that we consciously thought about. The first one, I mentioned I've been in the Navy. I've been around the world, living around the world, working. By far, this is the most collaborative community I've ever lived in. I've never lived in Huntsville. Sorry, Aaron. But this is by far the most collaborative community I've ever been in. Around here, people don't say, what's the problem? What's the, uh, what's the showstopper? It's, what can we do? Who, can, who wants to work on this? What outcomes can we create? And then they pitch in. And those resources, the focus on who can bring what and when and how much and how willing are they? We have organizations like MEDCO, the Maryland Economic Development Corporation, that bring money to the table and will actually fund construction. They will build dormitories. They'll build research facilities. They're building out our runway extension project here. They fund it, get some ROI on it, and then turn it over to the people that are going to uh, use it and run it from that point on. So bringing in the right resources with the right willingness and the right levels of uh, resources that they can apply, assets they can apply. And as Aaron mentioned, who can be your champions and who are you gonna be a champion for? Who really cares about it? What is the influence, the power they bring, whether it's state, lo level, local, federal, whatever? And even if they don't bring resources, what can they bring? Who can they influence? And that networking piece, I mentioned we uh, joined AURP almost immediately. We're not a research park yet. We aren't operating as a research park yet. But we wanted to make sure people are thinking that way, that they're aligning their thoughts in that direction. So we did join AURP, and that has made a tremendous difference being able to get the right people involved, getting people thinking the right way, getting the right assets put in place. The last three here are really kind of personal things, but I think they do apply across our community down here. We don't pay attention to name tags. It doesn't have to say, Aero Park Innovation just took on my name tag for me to do work in it. We get the people together that care about it, regardless of what organization they're from, and make sure that they can apply those efforts that need to be done. And they're not looking for credit or blame, just get into outcomes. And that last one there, as Aaron said, taking advantage of the opportunities. If you're prepared and the opportunity comes up, you just look lucky. But it's actually a lot of hard work. And the last slide for me is those outcomes. And it's tremendous. Uh, we've had a really good burgeoning business base. Uh, you can see the numbers here in front of me, the number of the workforce. It is about jobs eventually. But we are an airport. And now we are the largest and fastest growing public airport in the state. Uh, the research site is doing great. 
the last several are there are really those research focused kind of things on autonomy, building out our PhD lines. We're already diversifying into advanced manufacturing, microelectronics, micro manufacturing. And then the differentiator for us, which we haven't seen anywhere else, is the focus on test and evaluation of autonomy. So those are a lot of the outcomes, but we're still growing, still going strong, looking to create even more. My last slide is just my contact information, and I'm going to hand it off either to Aaron or Tim. I'm not sure which. So thanks. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, really appreciate uh, you and all that you are doing in Maryland and, and being a part of AURP. And I appreciate your partnership on the Air and Space Caucus as well. Um, so next in our final case study is Tim Sweeney. So Tim's the Senior Director of Advanced Manufacturing, Aerospace and Aviation with Jobs Ohio. Uh, that is the state's economic development agency. Tim's been with Jobs Ohio for about nine years now, I think it is and previously held roles within the aerospace and defense industry. So Tim, take it away. Uh, very good. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks, Matt. Uh, you know, one of the themes that we have uh, in our discussion today is collaboration. And I hope to share some of what we're doing here uh, at the state uh, and region and at the local level. Um, so uh, one of the areas that, that I focus on is advanced air mobility. That is the coming together of drones and EV tolls. But from the state of Ohio, we're the leading state uh, to Boeing and Airbus. Uh, we have uh, both uh, Air Force and uh, NASA facilities, um, NASA Glenn and uh, Neil Armstrong test facility up in Sandusky. Uh, GE Aerospace is headquartered uh, in Cincinnati. Uh, 565 uh, suppliers su support uh, the aerospace industry. So the, the question is, what are we doing from a strategy standpoint to really uh, marshal in the assets and the strength that we have? So th three uh, focus areas are, one is we are uh, uh, addressing uh, the commercial aviation, making sure that we're doing what we need to do there, uh, and also in space along with that, and then advanced air mobility. So that's uh, the, the emerging um, industry. Uh, Ohio is providing leadership, that, and I'll, I'll describe what that means. Um, and what you're seeing to the right here uh, are the different new vehicles that are entering into the marketplace. Uh, some are fixed wings, some are propelled. Uh, you have drones of many different uh, sizes uh, and uh, propulsion systems, um, but that is the new aviation. And so I want to, uh, I guess we talk about uh, how, what references, well, we'll call this the Jetsons era that we're emerging into uh, and wanted to share some of the good news that's, that's going on to bring this close to your community. Next slide, please. So if you look at what is Ohio's strategy, uh, very simple, build, test, and fly. Build, Ohio's manufacturing state, test, we have a, a, a test range where both piloted or an unpiloted a vehicle can fly over 220 square miles uh, without a chase vehicle uh, the, and then fly. Uh, that piece is all about how do we enable flight for these new vehicles? Uh, one of the great wins that we had in 2023 was uh, Joby Aviation as they begin to scale up operations. Uh, that was a uh, highly competitive, multiple states uh, competing for this. And Joby landed in Ohio and is building their uh, high volume production facility out at the Dayton International Airport. Uh, but that said, as we look at what is the prevailing market for EV tolls in Ohio, it's all about cargo logistics and healthcare, and then eventually passenger taxi. You know, as these uh, emerging vehicles come into the marketplace, their tempo for uh, market is New York City, Chicago, LA. Uh, San Francisco, that's where the passenger taxis are, are headed. Uh, but we uh, see that coming into the market 2025, 20, 26. Uh, and so the industry is scaling up to, to support that. Uh, what we have done is marshaled our strengths uh, across the state, both in research with stakeholders, our universities, our test facilities, and really uh, built strategy alignment, starting from the governor's office through the legislature, through our economic development team and partners that we have across the state and alignment with the university and research that's going on. Uh, so from a Jobs Ohio perspective, I'm providing leadership and strategy with my partners across the state, and I'll share a little bit more about that. Uh, but what, what I will say is we have federal partners who really have 
uh, we brought along into the discussion AFWorks located out at NASA, uh, out at uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base uh, through AFRL. They are uh, an extension of uh, as the uh, DOD begins to adopt uh, these uh, new vehicles, uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing, the eVTOLs. Uh, they are providing seed uh, funding to be able to support those early start companies to get them in to where they're mature and begin get, get flying. Next slide, please. So what is Jobs Ohio's role in this? Well, um, from an economic development, we work with industry, whether it's the supply chain or the OEMs. We're working focused with uh, helping, uh, whether it's attract the industry or help the industry grow in the state. Uh, also enabling infrastructure, and in Ohio, that is a Department of Transportation and being uh, aligned there, and then identifying what that market looks like. And so Jobs Ohio, our role in economic development is help facilitate that, uh, that strategy to begin operations. Next slide. So just to give you a, a pulse of where the industry is and where they're headed, um, uh, you see at the uh, on the top of the blue line there, you see the evolution, if you will, of a early concept design to prototyping to getting through flight test and eventually scale up. And then underneath the, the below and where they are on their um, uh, phase of development. So we are very much attuned to who the leaders are and uh, engaged with them on uh, what their plans are and how uh, we can help enable the industry. Th this is uh, not one of those things where you just sit back and, and, and eventually it'll come. You gotta provide leadership and you've gotta demonstrate capability and understanding the marketplace. And that's the role that we're playing to help the industry uh, thrive. Next slide. So where, where is the market? What is that market? So. Uh, if you look at the three major market segments, the healthcare delivery, so it could be the delivery of healthcare uh, items, whether it's surgical instruments, equipment, uh, it could be blood tissue, um, uh, it could be test specimens. So it, it, some of it can be uh, done with drones, some of it is being done with, if you're moving bulk items uh, with larger vehicles. Air taxis, we talk about that. Uh, we uh, in Ohio have established we call the uh, transportation corridor where there's a lot of commerce uh, up uh, I-71, starting from Cincinnati, going through Columbus, Ohio, all the way up to Cleveland. And so that's an area that we've defined as a regional air mobility corridor. Uh, cargo logistics certainly is one you're seeing uh, companies like UPS embracing uh, beta technologies into their fleet uh, as they begin to look at this electrified aircraft uh, as part of being mainstream. Next slide. So how did we approach this? What, uh, one of the things that we learned uh, through a market study that uh, Ohio's strength for uh, advanced air mobility really is in healthcare and logistics. Okay, that's good to know, but how real is that? So we've surveyed 15 different uh, hospitals across the state to uh, make sure that we have a diverse uh, outreach. And uh, you once in talking within the supply chain and logistics uh, folks, as you begin to have that conversation, First of all, you land on, I didn't know we could do that. And then as you begin to explore it, it opens up all kinds of opportunities for you know, efficiencies, uh, um, logistics. Of if you, you don't want to have to be in a situation where you're having to cancel surgery because you don't have the equipment that you need or the protocol instrument. Or can I move the doctor into where the patient is like it used to be? Um, so there's a lot of opportunities we, we found in this uh, early outreach uh, and so we've also seen through that partnerships with uh, Zipline, uh, who does package delivery, uh, teaming up, uh, collaborating with Cleveland Clinic and Ohio Health uh, in Columbus. So we've, we've, we've been intentional about how we do our outreach into the various communities. Uh, and then uh, ahead of that has been a series of roundtables to talk about what advanced air mobility is and why it's important. Next slide. So one of the things that, that I realized early on, it really does take a village to make this happen. And while I uh, am leading the state strategy for advanced air mobility and what that looks like to, to drive that, that economy, we recognize we need to leverage our economic development teams that we have across the, the state and have them build uh, regional teams. And so 
in doing that, they they can go focus on where the market opportunities, where the use cases are. Uh, but it was really bringing um, uh, through a, a collaboration, bringing together airports, universities, industry, the OEMs, the Metropolitan Planning Organization or, or MPOs, uh, economic development, other partners in around the table to identify where is the market opportunities, uh, the the, the uh, blue chart there that really it's, it's a it's a multifaceted discussion of, of capability that has to be uh, addressed uh, and topics to to, to discuss. Uh, but in, in essence, what we've done is we've established five regional teams across the state who are working at the local level to be able to understand how, what is the market opportunity in this part of Ohio. Uh, and I want to share the photo on the, the lower right there. Uh, we brought all those five teams up in January to have them brief out uh, what they're learning. And it was amazing to hear uh, different parts of Ohio, what those different use cases are. Uh, very different because they're different parts of the state, have different needs. Uh, so it's fa fascinating to hear that. And um, those uh, working teams continue to, to focus on it. You know, part of the the, the reality is, is is these teams came together and the ask was through our formation is put your badge aside. You're representing the region. You're representing a new uh, a, a new industry, a new uh, uh, part of aerospace, and bringing aerospace closer into uh, your metro areas or into your communities. Next slide. So another initiative that that we recognize um, in in advancing this, we've been at this well over a decade, but it was recognizing while Ohio is providing leadership, uh, and that was, was a, a spring of 2023. I was out with uh, at a, a conference out in Denver, AUVSI Exponential, and I met with my uh, in, uh, economic uh, leaders of Virginia. So it was Ohio and Virginia talking about where we are in the industry. And as we began to, well, while we compete in the marketplace, the question was, are we doing enough to accelerate this from an economic development? We have the vested interest. So now you have competitors looking at it and say, is it time for us to collaborate? So part of that was uh, through a, a period of months, we centered on meeting in Virginia and pulling eight, eight state aviation officials uh, of the aviation departments to have that conversation. And out of that was a recognition that yes, this, this is important. States do have a role to play as this industry grows and adopts, uh, but, the, but we need to make sure we uh, extend, you know, open the tent. And so my commitment to Virginia, my partners there was, uh, I would uh, host uh, in February of this year, we did, 18 states came around the table that were invited in. Uh, and, and it's open to all 50, but we had 18 states participating and really exploring issues around policy, uh, funding, uh, what's the type of infrastructure, charging infrastructure, hydrogen, storage, uh, traffic management, how do we address all those? July of this year, um, Oregon and uh, state of Washington co-hosted 28 state officials to continue that conversation, to build on that. Um, and so I just returned from Pittsburgh, uh, from the Niseo conference out there. Uh, fantastic. We now have 29 states and the Choctaw Nation who are part of the uh, AAM multi-state collaborative. So it really is um, recognizing where you are and recognizing who your partners are and when you need to pivot from uh, normally we compete in the marketplace, but maybe we need to think a little different. Next slide. So that's just uh, my uh, 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 credentials there, but email address, phone number. But please, uh, if you have questions about this, uh, we are very interested in making sure that this industry takes hold and uh, we want to be in that mentorship role. So don't hesitate to reach out, send me an email or give me a call. I'll turn it back to you, Aaron. Great. Thank you, Tim. It's really remarkable, the the partnerships that you all have across the state to lead to some of these um, technology initiatives that are really, um, it's beyond gaining traction at this point, but really continuing to advance um, the opportunities. Um, 
at this time, we are going to open it up for questions. I think Diana put in the chat to submit your questions uh, through the Q&A, and we would love to see those um, just to get the ball rolling and get y'all thinking um, about the q and I'll just start with one to uh, tee it up. And uh, it's to you, Matt. Um, what tools didn't work? the way you expected and what did you learn or figured out worked better? Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what tools didn't work tours. We thought, you know, build it and they will come and at college park where the main campus is. Yeah. You build it and the next day, 500 people are standing outside with their boxes ready to move in. Not so much in a remote rural area. So uh, we thought, you know, we'll give awareness to people are going to come in and see this building, see what's going on here at the aero park. Uh, see what's going on around the airport, the runways uh, expansion, everything, and they'll just clamor. And it hasn't been quite that way. Uh, I personally have done 150 tours in two years, and we're still kind of finding people. Oh, I didn't know you were there. So that's what didn't work. Just just doing awareness tours, uh, raising awareness, though that is important. Uh, the things that really did work: finding those engagement opportunities, coffee. By far, the number one. Uh, number two, uh, a, a local uh, colleague here started something called the Whiskey Club, where we actually do get together and drink some whiskey, but we also talk about what are you working on? What are you working on? What do you need me to pitch in with you on? And the thing that I've really found, especially being part of the university and hopefully not being too uh, parochial, is students. Anything that had anything to do with students, whether they were kindergarten, high school, college, graduate students, whatever, if I could bring a student activity or engagement opportunity into a discussion, industry, governances were all over it. One, because they want employees, but also they just want to get involved with the kids and how energizing they are and interesting they are and bringing them into the fold of stuff like Tim's working on and you're working on. Just they want to get into that stuff and they also want to have their influence on it. So uh, anything with students. Uh, that was really one of the biggest ones. Uh, if I can pull that in somehow into any activity, that pretty much guarantees engagement. And then you can just go from there. Yeah. And coffee and whiskey isn't bad either. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we do have, we, we did get a question in the Q&A. Uh, so we're going to tick, tick it on. And then Tim, I do have a follow-up question for you as well. Um, hopefully we'll have time to get to those. Um, uh, Todd uh, Christensen asked, how do you evaluate and manage what initial infrastructure investments to make for a large master plan like yours, where much of the future build out is unknown? I would say the, the real evaluation uh, um, metric is ROI, but ROI measured in different ways. It could be a monetary ROI. It could be an impact ROI. It could be a involving underrepresented, underexposed communities ROI. It could be a cultural ROI. So I know most people approach it strictly from a monetary ROI. You can't, we don't think you can really do it exactly that way, but that does obviously matter. Uh, the partners that are involved are also going to influence uh, what parts of the infrastructure. One of the things that we've really tried to focus on is what are the investments that we can make today that will enable future engagement in the future at maybe lower cost levels. So things like making uh, the pads on the airport shovel ready. So Medco is working with us on making sure that the build out on the west end of the runway is shovel ready for future hangars, future expansion. This building was all about future growth. So uh, the state actually funded 85 of the $86 million the state funded because they saw the potential for the students, but also for the community in this building to have this kind of facility that we really didn't know exactly how it was going to be used. And that's really my full-time job is helping to figure that out. But those are the kind of things that we think about. It's not just monetary. Uh, hopefully Chris agrees with me on that. And I would also, I mean, I would agree with you. Uh, the city of Huntsville made our initial infrastructure. I mean, they, they bought the land, they put in the roads, the utilities, um, and, you know, I'm sure they did it based on back in the day, did it based on some projections, but they knew that they both had to have, you know, Tim and your world, they had to have the site and it was ready to go. But then the city took the extra step working with the Chamber of Commerce to create a position that would lead to that would lead the development of recruiting those companies, of growing and supporting the companies internally and putting that infrastructure in um, 
you know, in that person um, in at that time to really drive that, um, to leverage the the investment that that municipality made. And so I think that, you know, uh, you can look at it that way, too. Hey, Aaron, uh, so I, if I could just add to that, yeah, it's, yeah, something that, that we have found is site ready. That is something that or as you're attracting companies in or you're you're building uh, the your your ecosystem there having a site ready to as soon as you're ready to to uh, roll out your program uh you know that's very important instead of saying okay we got to go do the environmentals we got to go do um and, and so that pushes things way out so we found success in that oh yeah absolutely makes a big difference um tim speaking of kind of uh, your community at large, if you will, in some of these communities where you have um, these different collaborations, what should communities be thinking about to embrace the AAM? Yeah, so uh, part of it that, that I have uh, experienced over the last three years, it's education. So part of it is is uh, marshalling your, your, your resources that you have there, economic development, maybe it's your airports, or maybe you have a, a, a test uh, center but coming together and with your transportation department and, and really uh, do a series of roundtables across the state, across the different communities, where that area of innovation would take hold. Uh, as you look at community acceptance, community integration, uh, you're going to get varying opinions. And so part of it is making it real, making it tangible, uh, taking them to uh, the, the the colleges and universities and allowing them to see that the, the this is real this we aren't waiting the technology is, is pretty well proven and the FA is doing their best to help uh, get that through certification so th that uh, education I think Aaron is really the, the top of the list and so it's got to be intentional and it needs to be uh, certainly statewide and Speaking of the FAA, how have they been to work with in these different efforts? I know, I think probably different communities have different experiences. What's been yours? <laughs> yes, yeah, well, absolutely. And I'll, let's go from the industry perspective. So the the OEMs, uh, you know, is it a helicopter? Is it an airplane? And so then that gets into the policy and regulatory. Uh, and, and so the FAA has had to rethink that on what that would look like and what those uh, new regulations uh, look like. And so they've been working directly with the OEMs, helping to get the hours, uh, airworthiness hours, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to make that happen. Here in Ohio, working with our partners at AFRL, uh, they can actually uh, issue a military flight release mm -hmm. uh, that is equivalent to the FAA because they know that process and be able to uh, have the OEM receive the certification to be able to begin flying their uh, their business case or their their aircraft, but the FAA they they're on a, a journey too with with the industry as it's evolving. Mm -hmm. Sure, Matt's over here shaking his head as a as a retired aviator, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's day to day. What it's you're it's really been dramatic. Uh, Tim hit the nail on the head. It's really been dramatic uh, to see how far the FAA has come, but also to see the turnover in the industry. We had a lot of young industry, uh, a lot of startups that have failed because they just didn't want to recognize that the FAA, number one, is the airspace owner, but also they have a track record. They do things a certain way because it works. Airworthiness authorities, airworthiness evaluations. We stood up an airworthiness evaluation based on the mill standard uh, handbook with our university as part of our process because we understood the value, of it, just like Tim said, mm -hmm. and it made us huge dividends. But being able to speak to the language of the FAA with companies, with government agencies, with uh, your local communities, was dramatic. And like Tim said, educating all the people that want to be involved. And this is what you really need to know before you come into this conversation. Bring your brilliant ideas, but you better come ready to talk about airworthiness and hours and data, all those things. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, we've just got a couple of minutes left um, and want to be respectful of everyone's time. First, I want to say, you know, thank you to both Tim and Matt. Uh, for joining this discussion, sharing your case studies, sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly, as we like to say um, in AURP. Uh, we can all learn from each other. And so um, I think this webinar is a perfect example of that. 
Um, thank you to those of you who joined today. Hopefully you got something out of this, including kind of those takeaways uh, to take back and, and have conversations at your um, your organization. And um, thanks for joining AURP. It's a great network. We, we all collaborate with one another. We are all open um, to sharing and caring as the saying goes. And um, we just want to thank you all for joining and, and learning more. And um, with that, we will uh, call this webinar to a close. Thanks for everybody for participating. And thank you, AURP. Thanks, Aaron.